Hi, I'm Dave Mishuk. I'm the Wood Energy Specialist here at the Cold Climate Housing Research Center in Fairbanks, Alaska. This video will highlight the process of retrofitting an existing masonry fireplace into a high-performance masonry heater like the one behind me. The complete set of plans for this project is available through Cold Climate Housing Research Center's website at cchrc.org. If you're interested in taking on a masonry heater project like the one shown in this video, we advise hiring experienced and certified installers and installing proven design. Construction plans for masonry heaters for new installations are available from the Masonry Heater Association of North America at mha-net.org. We hope you enjoy this production. The existing fireplace is a brick masonry unit in a Fairbanks home constructed in the 1950s. These fireplaces were commonly installed in houses of that era, typically have a very low efficiency and do not contribute significant heat to the house. Converting this fireplace to a high performance masonry heater will increase efficiency, burn less wood, and reduce fuel oil consumption while more thoroughly heating the home. Before starting construction of the masonry heater, we have to demolish a portion of the existing fireplace. The firebox and smoke shelf were removed leaving us with only the existing chimney. Additional structural elements need to be installed to support the new heater. The new heater retrofit was designed by Norbert Senf of Shawville, Quebec, specifically for this installation. The facing for the heater is natural rock from a river in Haley, Alaska. The core of the heater is behind the exterior rock facing. It's constructed of fire brick and refractory concrete and forms the firebox, heat exchange surfaces, and flue passages that define a masonry heater. A masonry heater works differently from a traditional fireplace because of the path the flue gas travels. Wood is burned in the firebox of the heater and combustible gases are burned in the secondary combustion chamber immediately above the main firebox. The design of the firebox, secondary combustion chamber, and the insulative nature of the fire brick allow for combustion efficiency that can approach 98%. The hot flue gas leaves the secondary combustion chamber through ports in the sidewalls of the firebox where it enters two heat exchange cavities on either side. These are referred to as bells. The hottest gas rises to the top of the bells and then travels downward as heat is transferred to the fire brick core and the gas cools. At this point, the flue gas temperature is relatively low as the gas travels underneath the firebox into the chimney outlet at the rear. The gas then exits through the existing masonry chimney behind the firebox. Right this moment, we're preparing for a new steel beam support uh, in the floor system here. And the steel beam is going to carry a brand new slab, which will support the masonry heater, and the mass is about 10,000 pounds. Uh, so what we had was an existing floor system that wasn't really designed for that load. So this, as the first step of the retrofit, we have to... Uh, essentially build the foundation for the heater here. So this is the boiler room. This is the space immediately below our work area uh, from where we just came. Our new steel beam is above this old hearth slab. You get supported on this foundation wall, and the end of the steel beam is approximately here. As you can see, we, we were just a little overzealous with the roto hammer, uh, making the access hole for our column. Uh, one of the problems is that this infrastructure here, the boiler and all the pipes, we tried not to modify. So, in coming up with this support system, although it seems uh, fairly simplistic when you look at it, it took a long time to arrive at this solution. So that uh, we have to do minimal demolition to the existing floor system and uh, not interfere with any of the work down here. So this is our column. This is actually, uh, we fabricated this in two pieces so that we can get this in around the plumbing pipes and up through the pipes to support that steel beam 
and we'll be able to weld this in place. installed the steel beam and we've placed the column, uh, steel tube column in the basement to support this end of the steel beam. The other end of the steel beam was grouted solid to the foundation wall below. Um, and what we're going to do today is set up to pour the support slab for the masonry heater unit. Um, we have a little bit of welding to do on site here. Uh, we have a, a ledger angle that will actually carry the facing stone. It's a uh, river rock so it's pretty heavy. So we have a steel framing, steel angle that ties into the steel beam that we've installed. Um, and it's important that we have the steel support structure because we can't have uh, concrete or heavy stone actually bearing on the wood floor elements because the floor joists weren't designed for that kind of load. And so we're going to reinforce this uh, over the beam. The beam is going to become integral with the slab. Uh, as a composite beam and we're going to reinforce the firebox and the floor system to further strengthen this installation. So this ledger angle carries the exterior uh, facing, the pretty thick river rock facing of the, the finished heater and uh, it's supported over here by drilled in anchors to the existing masonry uh, to be welded to this beam to carry this end and these rebar stubs actually help to transfer a load from the angle into the new structural slab. Last Friday we poured a concrete slab to carry the weight of the heater and the, the veneer of the heater. Now today we stripped the forms off that we poured a Friday and now today we put the substrate which is a high temperature refractory cement. So that'll actually be the bottom of the combustion chamber and the, and the side bells. The regular Portland cement breaks down under heat and what happens it's got a microscopic bonding. It's, it's hydrated so it has little water droplets. So when heat gets to it at temperatures of over four or five hundred degrees it starts expanding and spalls and breaks down. And hopefully our temperatures are going to be way more than that in here because uh, we want to be able to gasify the wood. So regular cement would not work for us and that's why we're using this high temperature refractory cement.
modified this a little bit from the original plan. We've added this part here and here, and then we put this in because we've got a castable slab going on there, and we want a few more pillars to kind of hold the hold the weight and distribute it a little better. So the slab will go on top of here now, and what happens? The fire chamber is here, comes up. And then the free gas movement just kind of flows like this, and then at this point there's a couple flue slots that go off into the bell. And then the warm air will rise, and that free gas will finally just work its way down. Underneath this slab, this castable slab, down through here, and then up and out the chimney in the back. This area right in here is our combustion chamber and we're hoping to achieve 1800 to 2000 degrees for gasification of wood. So come up in this area here, spin around and there'll be slots on the sides here. We'll run off into these side bells, down underneath here and then come up this chimney out the back. But because of the high heat in this combustion chamber and lower temperatures in the other areas, we, we have expansion gaps at all the places that anything else runs into it areas here, 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 and there. This is an insulative and an expansive ex expansion joint because this gets really hot. It's got to be able to move different temperatures in the outside veneer. It's high temperature. It's about 25, 2700 degrees. You can use a, a variety of other things. We prefer the, the really good quality. We gotta get this back chimney ran up. We're actually, when we get closer to this, we'll start corbling like this old wall was. We'll corbel that down so that we can get into an eight inch round. We'll have to have a transition. And somewhere in this area to be determined, we have that transition, we'll also have a uh, damper with a, sh a shut off. And we'll probably run it through this wall, drill a hole so we can have a handle that will slide it on and off. Once we get that up, then we can run this firebox on up in this front part and then we can run the side channels. After we get all the side channels and the firebox up then we can uh, put the stone veneer on the outside. come up I believe about three or four courses here in the uh, bells of the heater. A special feature here is that we have these cast, we've been calling them cross ties, and these are to stabilize the walls of these bells for seismic forces. And these cross ties are actually uh, castable refractory 
and they have threaded rod inserted through them and it's just a low carbon rod and what we did was we wrapped these so there's a bond breaker uh, between the steel and this uh, cross piece so the way this works in theory is these get embedded in the concrete pour that happens behind the uh, core of the heater uh, so we have a tension link of the rod and uh, there'll be straps that tie the whole front face of this, steel straps, to hold the whole body for the seismic weight. Um, so these rods, in theory, hold the tension load, and the cast part itself holds the compression load. So these are cast in concrete. There are others that are actually epoxied back into the wall. So these are, are drilled in and set with a high strength epoxy. So again, this provides a tension force on the bolt and a compression force against this wall. We continued the base of the chimney up behind the firebox and it's corpling over to fit the, uh, the geometry of the existing space. We, we've reinforced behind it. It will be poured solid with concrete and uh, we're getting, getting to the point where we need a final transition to the stainless steel chimney liner that's going to be installed with a damper at this location. So we're, we're going to course this out one more course and then determine the shape of our final transition. The existing chimney is solid masonry all the way through, so with an extreme temperature differential, the top of the chimney would be very cold and it would have condensation issues. So by putting in the liner and insulating it, it's going to keep the, uh, the flue warmer so we'll avoid the condensation issues. So today we've continued uh, with our courses of um, fire brick on the bells. We've brought the fire box uh, height up further. And what we've been doing is uh, pouring concrete behind every day. Um, reinforced concrete. We made a custom um, damper, combination damper and chimney adapter. It's half inch plate steel with welded connections and uh, <clears throat> there wouldn't be any access um, for a damper straight through the firebox so we had to go to the side. We're relining this chimney with uh, a stainless steel liner and uh, it'll have, we'll pour vermiculite concrete around it and that'll be uh, insulative and it'll also lock it in place. So we just dropped the uh, chimney through the, uh, the existing chimney open, opening and we've seated it on the plate and we have to uh, seal around here with some caulk and uh, we'll block this area out for the linkage so that it stays free of uh, any kind of concrete but the rest of it will be encased in uh, this vermiculite concrete. Well today we poured the insulating concrete. Uh, around the, the new stainless steel chimney liner. 
It's a mix concrete. It's, it's actually not concrete. It's Portland cement mixed with perlite or vermiculite, which is a natural occur naturally occurring insulating mineral. It's fireproof. It's a volcanic um, rock almost, and uh, so it has it has air trapped in it. So it's that's what makes it insulating. It's uh, almost like a loose styrofoam. So this will insulate that chimney liner to avoid condensation issues at the top of the chimney uh, when the temperatures are real low. And the reason we had to do this, this is an important step actually, because um, it's behind the, the body of the masonry heater. And so for the work to progress in front, we have to finalize the work be, behind it. So we need to take care of that. Um, and then we can button that up, it disappears and continue on with the, the heater in the front. As you recall, we put a chimney liner in and we poured concrete on a cold day. So we insulated, after we finished the pour, um, we opened the chimney top, the chimney damper, we put insulation on the top. And uh, that light bulb provides enough heat that um, convection will take warm air up to the top and keep the uh, chimney insulated for a few days while the uh, Portland cement cures. And it also helps to cure the, uh, the refractory mortar and the bricks. So um, the, the moisture of that mortar needs to be driven off before we have a significant firing uh, in use of the masonry fireplace. If, if we keep that heated by the time uh, we get the, the face put on and ready to fire, it should be fairly well cured. Today we're deforming the capping slabs for the masonry heater. These were cast in our lab here at CCHRC yesterday afternoon. Uh, and these are the parts that actually form the top lid of the heater body and the two bells. So we've just taken out these, form these uh, slabs out of the forms and we can see that there's very little air voids all the way around, and that's a good sign. Yeah, the more air voids in there, the weaker the, the refractory concrete would be. So when we formed these, we actually uh, poured the concrete in and then vibrated the mix uh, on the edge of the forms, and this eliminates all the air bubbles. Cardboard is placed between the fire brick core and the rock facing to allow for expansion of the inner core unit. We were able to continue our uh, seismic reinforcing. And the way this works is previously we showed the uh, seismic ties, they were cast um, cross ties. So then we installed this framework, the steel framework, and it's actually on this side, it's tied back to the structure with uh, redhead anchors, which are expansion anchors into the existing structure. All these ties that go back to the existing structure are intended to keep uh, the heater from falling over in an earthquake. Because it's very narrow and very tall, it has a tendency to want to uh, overturn. Now, the, the other thing that these straps do, they also hold these ties that actually go into the mortar joints of the facing rock. So these will be uh, placed, as Dan brings up the, the river rock on the outside, these ties will be placed and so the, the mortar in the joints actually bonds to these and these ties actually hold the face from falling off as well. The first course of the facing stone 
has uh, clean out ports and these are provided at the base of the heater where the flue gases come uh, down from the chambers under the firebox and up the chimney. The horizontal, lowest horizontal surface is a place where uh, fly ash will accumulate. So what we've done is we've provided these clean out ports and there's actually a, a hole in the brickwork to access the flue. These are mortared in place and they'll have these doors that fit like so. So through these ports the base of the heater um, flue channel can be cleaned and also the base of the chimney. I'm in CCHRC's shop today, and uh, what we're doing is we're making a frame for the firebox door for the mason heater. And uh, this is a, called an air wash frame. The air that comes in from the outside is actually going to come, uh, the combustion air, come up into the frame. So when this frame is completely finished, it'll have a way for air to get in and it'll have uh, outlet ports on the inside of the frame um, with some deflectors so that the, the air actually washes the door to keep the door clean. And so this is a custom fabricated part. It's essentially a rectangular tubing that gets welded together. And the door is a uh, A standard size masonry heater door. Generally, they're manufactured in uh, Europe in their cast iron. So, this is a factory made masonry heater door, and the frame is our uh, custom edition. We previously placed the uh, steel airframe into the masonry that's actually anchored to the, uh, the structural element of the heater. And what we did today was we installed a standard Upo door from Finland. And this is a cast iron door with ceramic glass and it's gasketed all the way around.
So what we did today as we're putting the door on, making the final preparations for to start our curing fire schedule, we actually went and put the permanent chimney rain cap on there. So we removed all the temporary insulation and we riveted the stainless steel rain cap on. Now as you see we've prepared the fire box. This heater was designed for <coughs> excuse me, a 60 pound load of wood. So a 60 pound charge we burned at one time. And as part of the curing schedule, uh, it's recommended that we use 10% of the maximum load of wood for a number of repeated firings to drive off any remaining moisture from the brick and mortar of the heater body. Well, you're actually seeing the flue gas path. It's traveled up from the firebox into the uh, bells that we've talked about before. It's exiting the, the base of those bells and it goes back under the firebox before it enters the chimney base behind the firebox. So you're seeing the natural flow path of the gases at the base of the heater. There's a, a vent space left here. The heater actually has to be, the heater core has to be uh, a minimum clearance from the walls. And so there's a cavity behind the, the, uh, the rock facing between the wall and the heater core. Likewise, at the top there's a minimum clearance from the capping slabs to the ceiling. So this cavity is going to be hidden behind the rock facing. And what we want to do is we want to vent that. We want to vent the hot air out. So, so we also have a register at the top of the heater on the opposite end. So this space will be vented and actually uh, natural convection will occur from the far side. Cooler air will come in the bottom flow up the side of the heater on the far end, across the top, and out of this register. Well, we're going to just monitor this uh, fire to ensure that it's working the way it's supposed to. After we're certain of that, we'll leave the homeowner to continue these curing fires, and so that'll take about a week. So we'll uh, instruct him how to do that and that's exactly why we let him take it for there okay, for a short period the, the water could be driven off Today we're doing emissions testing on the fireplace retrofit and uh, we've brought our portable dilution tunnel which is an emission sampler to pick up particulates and a flue gas analyzer. We did a one test run here so far with about 42 pounds of wood. And so we've been monitoring the uh, progress here through the burn cycle and continuously collecting data. We control the vacuum motor to maintain a constant pressure across the filter set. Um, so this is connected to the dilution tunnel that actually picks up the particulates. The computer is collecting data from the flue gas analyzer. So you can see, uh, for example, some of the things that it's continuously collecting. So we have the temperature, ambient temperature, 82 degrees, stack temperature, and that's uh, at the location of the, the stack probe, which is just above the top of the heater. 310 degrees, percent oxygen, parts per million CO, percent CO2. This gives us a, an instantaneous um, idea of the efficiency as well. So 74%. Excess air, this is in percentage, 328. This is uh, the amount of air 
more than the theoretical um, air required to have combustion with that wood and temperature of the instrument, excuse me, temperature of the instrument, 92.2. We can determine um, the particulate emissions rate and compare it directly to other appliances that are already rated like uh, pellet stoves and wood stoves. And we can also directly determine um, the combustion efficiency, so that's how well the fire is burning in there, and then the overall efficiency, which also includes um, the heat transfer ability of the heater. All right, we're back at the uh, fireplace retrofit house, and uh, as you can see, the masonry heater is now complete. Uh, since we visited last time, uh, all the rock face has been completed. It's actually been about two months that the homeowner's been using this, and they're very pleased. One aspect when considering a project like this is that it is uh, time consuming and very involved process involving many different trades. So for instance, uh, constructing this heater here involved uh, engineering. So we had a structural engineer for the floor supports. We had a qualified welder. We had carpenters to work on the floor framing. We had a mason to actually construct the heater itself. And we had to go through the permitting process with the city of Fairbanks. So it's not really a, a weekend project. However, if you're a, a skilled with your hands, it's certainly a doable project. This project took about five weeks uh, and we had up to five people working on it. In its finished state, this heater uh, with the core unit, which is fire brick, and the natural rock facing weighs approximately 10,000 pounds. The interesting thing is that you actually have to carry 10,000 pounds one piece at a time, whether it's individual rocks or 50 pound bags of uh, concrete. So as you can see, the uh, fire burns really well, uh, extremely complete combustion. We were here just after we completed this uh, masonry heater, and we actually did uh, emissions testing for two days, and uh, the results were really surprising to us, that the, the emissions level of this heater is actually much lower than we would have predicted. So as a, a retrofit experiment, that's extremely positive. And because of that clean burning nature, there isn't much um, maintenance that needs to happen to the heater over the course of the year or years. Generally on a daily basis or uh, every couple days the ash would be cleaned from the firebox and disposed of. And th the fireplace really doesn't create any creosote. The main byproduct is, is fly ash. Now some of that fly ash uh, travels up through the flues because it's very light aside from the ash that settles in the bottom of the firebox and the fly ash settles out along the way so as you recall this firebox is uh, very tall it has an outlet and channels that come down the side the flue passages go under the firebox and up the chimney in the back so these cleanouts are here so that the homeowner can access the flue channels where the fly ash would settle out. So probably every year, every two years, uh, the homeowner can take a vacuum cleaner and they can not only access all the flues at the base of the heater, but they can access the base of the chimney through these two. So there's a clear passage back to the base of the chimney. So any fly ash that settles out of the chimney area can be cleaned as well. 
So overall, this retrofit project was really fun to work on, and uh, the owners have stated that it exceeds their expectations in many ways. Um, the functionality of the masonry heater unit, the aesthetics, and also uh, the reduced heating cost. They report that they have saved approximately 20% of their heating oil bill by using the masonry heater. For more information about masonry heaters, this particular retrofit, uh, the plans for this retrofit, please visit cchrc.org. Good luck with your masonry heater projects.